Hello and welcome to The Drama. I'm Dan Borshia coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. Coming up, political turbulence, new accusations of sweetheart deals by Labor to protect Qantas. Lowe's last stand, the outgoing RBA governor defends his leadership with one regret. And get ready to rumble how mixed martial arts has won Aussie fans and infuriated critics. Joining me on the panel tonight, Uluru Statement Leadership and APY artist Sally Scales. Great to have you along. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, senior counsel at Premier National and former Liberal MP Fiona Scott. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And Canberra Business and Economy Editor at The Conversation, Peter Martin. Welcome. Good day. And Australian boxer and Olympian Harry Garside. Great to have you back. Thanks for having me on, Dan. <laughs> and you can join us online using the hashtag the drum and we live stream on Facebook as well. Well, first tonight, the government is under increasing pressure over its decision to reject Qatar Airways' bid to double its Australian flights. The Transport Minister, Catherine King, spoke to the media this morning to address the stream of negative headlines and fallout from the decision. It's been revealed that in July, Minister King wrote a letter to five Australian women who were invasively strip-searched at Doha Airport in 2020, informing them that she'd rejected the airline's application. At the time, the minister told nine papers that the treatment of the women hadn't influenced her decision. Today, under questioning from journalists, her response changed. Certainly, for context, you know, this is the only airline that has something like that, uh, that has happened. And so I can't say that, you know, I wasn't aware of it, uh, but certainly it wasn't the only factor. It was, one, it was a factor. What are the other factors? What are the other factors? Well, again, as I said, I don't think it's helpful for me to point to any one factor. Uh, we make decisions in the national interest all of the time. But, but let me just again, factor. just I haven't, I haven't pointed factor. to that as one factor. What I have said is that it provides a context for the decision uh, that I make. There is a context there uh, that is there. You know, that's a fact. That is, you know, a context that is there. But the opposition doesn't accept that explanation. Quite frankly, I don't think that it's any clearer today than it was yesterday. What was behind the decision to deny Qatar Airways additional routes to Australia that would have increased competition and decreased the price of airfares for ordinary Australians? She said that there was no one factor, but that issue of the women provided context, but she wouldn't point to any other factor that was there. Uh, quite frankly, I think there's still a lot of questions to answer, and that's why we've set up this Senate inquiry. Peter, so today the minister explained that part of the context for the government rejecting Qatar Airways uh, was that factor. It was, quote, a one factor, uh, but certainly it wasn't the only factor. So does this close the matter? She also said it wasn't a factor, by the way. So in, in the space of an hour between 7 a.m. press conference at the airport and uh, a.m. Uh, interview, um, she said a different thing. But, but uh, behind all of that, so it was either a factor or it was context. Behind all of that is this shield of uh, national interest. And she was asked, you know, where does this... Um, is this a usual thing? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, it happens for foreign investment decisions. Yes, she's right. And that's the only other area, well, until now, the only area in which you can avoid scrutiny, not have to explain your decision by saying it's in the national interest. Uh, that kind of thing is wrong. It is against uh, evidence-based decision-making. It is against even allowing people to you know, work out, hey, you made the decision now. I'm very glad there's a Senate inquiry now to um, uh, pull apart uh, why she made this decision. Did she make it to protect Qantas? Stephen Jones, uh, you know, the Assistant Treasurer, seemed to suggest that, that that was important. Did she make it in protest at the actions of the Qatar government, not the Qatar airline, or for some other reason. She's listed about six reasons, as far as I can see. Well, I want to go, go to those reasons with you, because you touched on national security uh, just a moment ago, but the, the Minister and the government have also talked about airline viability, human rights, and a whole raft of other reasons to explain why this happened. Why has this been so messy? I've no idea. I've, when the decision was announced, uh, well, it wasn't announced in July. The Financial Review found uh, out about it 
later. I, I've, look, it, it is incomprehensible. Um, the Prime Minister says he wasn't involved. You, I guess, should believe that, but he is a former transport minister, a former infrastructure minister. He has close relations with Qantas, so close that, uh, unfortunately, perhaps for the Voice campaign, he was, uh, uh, you know, stood with uh, the probably the, the most hated chief executive in Australia, Alan Joyce, who until uh, yesterday was the chief executive of Qantas, uh, stood next to him, uh, you know, with a Qantas plane painted with a Yes logo. Uh, so he's sort of um, identifying himself with Qantas. This decision hurts its competitor Virgin. Virgin has uh, an alliance with Qatar Airlines. Qantas has an alliance with Emirates, which competes with Qatar on, on the same, uh, you know, European uh, flight. Um, I, I cannot explain this. That, that, that I, I cannot understand the decision. Uh, and uh, it may well be, as she said, that there are a number of reasons and together they add up to something. It's hard to tell. Mm. Yeah, and you mentioned about the Prime Minister. I understand the Prime Minister told Parliament that he didn't know. This morning we saw reporting, uh, Fiona, that the decision was made about a week by the, before the Minister told the Prime Minister so that they're, certainly the Prime Minister, by all indications, had no idea that this happened. But... The government tried to turn this on Nationals MP, um, the, the Nationals MP Michael McCormack, who also rejected applications by Qatar Airways when in government. Is this just par for the course for politicians? I don't think so. I think this is a very murky decision. It's very unclear. And, and it also shows, I think, the inability of the minister to explain even when the prime minister knew. Now, during COVID, for instance, um, you know, Scott Morrison made a decision around these sorts of decisions. Primarily, it came out of the Biosecurity Act, whereby, yes, he became the minister for everything. The reason for doing that is because there's a range of executive powers that sit with ministers, which I think no longer in line with Australian standards. Now, Morrison found this issue, the way he handled it, dubious, not completely wrong. However, decisions like this, the expectation of the Australian public is that the Prime Minister would be told, the Prime Minister would be part of the decision making and potentially even part of the announcement of something of this magnitude, particularly when the minister's throwing out national security and national interest and all of these other things, why is the prime minister kept out of it? Now, Morrison shouldn't have just made himself the minister for everything, but I think at that point, it became very clear that there's all these different executive powers sitting in all these different portfolios whereby they should perhaps go to cabinet, they should go to a subcommittee of cabinet, or they should at least be countersigned off by the prime minister himself or herself. And, and I think there's an issue here of process. There's an issue here that the minister can't explain why the decision's taken place and then says, well, it provides context. Well, context is also a reason. Context provides framing as to why you made something. Um, so, look, I don't believe Labor have made the right decision here. And at the end of the day, when we look at our airline decisions, I mean, I agree with what you were saying about Alan Joyce. He has been one of the most unpopular, dare I say, even erred on the side of arrogant um, uh, CEOs that we've had in this country. Heard on the side of. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to not get us defamed here. <coughs> so, so you know. I don't think you can defame a company. <laughs> no, no. But I made it about on Joyce. Yeah, yeah, but, but, my, but my point there is that there's a whole range of things from from Joe Kelly's comments around you know Anthony Albanese not declaring the um, chairman's club membership of his son you know and all of the closeness being Qantas and the government the amount of money they received through COVID I appreciate that was under a liberal government there's a whole range of issues here and then right through to the competition issues with Virgin that Catherine King has not explained this has also highlighted that the Prime Minister wasn't known was she protecting him is she not protecting him it just smells and it needs to go through the Senate inquiry and I applaud Senator Hume for doing that. Yeah, Joe Aston has certainly made it. Um, oh, sorry, Joe Aston. Uh, quite, mentioned that quite a bit. Sally, the, the letter from the Australian women who were strip searched said Qatar Airways is, quote, not fit to carry passengers around the globe, let alone to major Australian airports. So should the government, if this in fact was a factor or the factor, depending mm. on which comments you're looking at, into Waikato couldn't expand services? Should they be reviewed coming to Australia at all? I think if 
if that's one of the reasons, then definitely they need to be looking at that. I mean, as Fiona said, the murkiness of all of it is disturbing because you want politicians to be actually say things clearly and give the information to all of us. I mean, this is issues that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have experienced all the time when it comes to laws and policies about us. So when we look at this, you know, it's like this, women experience something um, really disgusting and obviously they feel hurt by that. And it's something that we need to look at. I also think that in Australia we should have airlines that are competitive with each other, that are getting the best for our country, um, rather than just having a monopoly. I think that that's not helpful for anyone. I mean, I would love to travel over to WA that's not costing an arm and leg or, a th you know, almost the same price as going over to Europe. Mm. So it's those, those numbers that you look at and it also goes into the framework of what is in Australia. We do love to visit our country. We do love to v visit around the world and we are so far removed. I think that there needs to be clear answers and all of that, but those women should actually be able to have a proper conversation and, you know, getting a letter saying this is part of the reason or gives context to why I've done this. It just builds more murkiness. It should be very clear cut saying this was a factor into it. This was why I was concerned. You know, and if that is a part of the concerning factors into why that happened, then definitely. Harry, this is all happening in the context of a cost of living pressures crisis where things are getting more and more expensive. We know that there is very little competition in the airline, uh, the aviation sector. So what does this say about competition in that sector and bringing down prices, which surely has got to be as part of that national interest. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I was almost going to reiterate what, what Sally just said around, I think Qantas right now almost has a monopoly in that market. Of course, there is some other international uh, airlines that do fly out of Australia, but Qantas is by far the biggest. And I think um, it's obviously very heartbreaking and it's terrible to hear what happened to those women during COVID um, under Qatar Air Airways. But you can't deny that Qatar, I think the last time I looked, they're second or third in Skytrex uh, on the award-winning um, companies. They're, they're one of the, the front runners in that industry. And I think to not have them sort of, I guess, pushing Qantas to potentially lower prices or compete with Qantas in some way, shape or form for the benefit of the Australian public, I think that would be the better outcome personally. Mm. And, and Peter, just before we move on, there, there is a question, isn't there, here about who actually perpetrated uh, those strip searches of whether... Because it was the government, not necessarily the airline. Yeah, although, to be fair, the government owns the airline of course. In, in, in that instance. But it was the police, mm. right? Um, and presumably, if that had happened on a Qantas flight, not that Qantas goes to that airport, but if it had been on a Qantas flight, the police would have still um, acted in the same way. Can I just say something about what you said, Harry, which is it tells me about how far we've come. And, you know, as an economist, someone who looks at this, I am so pleased. Go back to the 1960s, right, time of the voice referendum. Go back then. All of the time, governments imposed tariffs. They imposed quotas on the number of foreign cars you could import, the number of foreign goods, the foreign clothes, and Australians weren't perturbed by that. We thought, oh good, they're supporting an Australian company and a company like Qantas. Now we seem to have finally got it that it hurts us when we don't allow foreign competitors in. And, you know, 50 years on, I, I just feel like, um, gee, the kind of thing that me and others have been saying for years, the Australian public has finally got it. When you don't allow foreign goods in, in this case foreign seats, um, you are hurting Australians, forcing them to pay more, denying them the ability to, to buy what we want. I'm so pleased, I just want to take a moment and look back to think that this is now a mainstream political issue. For decades people were complaining about tariffs, I mean economists were, and no one listened.
Mm. Well, I think we're going to be having more conversations about tariffs in the <laughs> weeks and months ahead. Well, in the first full week of campaigning on the Voice referendum, the former Prime Minister Tony Abbott has taken aim at leading Yes campaigner Noel Pearson and labelled the referendum a blank cheque for change. In the past, the pair has considered each other friends, but today in a column in the Australian newspaper, the former PM trashed Pearson's stance on The Voice. In times past, Pearson's public advocacy has been of great service to our country. If only the Mandela side to his character hadn't been subsumed these past few years by that of a tribal chief waging a guerrilla campaign against an oppression that is long since past and that has been replaced by the tyranny of low expectations that a grievance and entitlement-obsessed voice would just reinforce. The column came in response to Pearson's call for Yes campaigners to engage respectfully with those undecided voters considered soft nose. Meanwhile, opposition leader Peter Dutton has responded to a speech by a senior member of the referendum working group, Professor Marcia Langton, who criticised the methods and messaging from the No campaign. Now, in terms of Marcia Langton and her views, she's one individual. Uh, she's an activist and a very strong supporter of the Labor Party. I accept that, and that's her right. Uh, she's going to vote yes, she's advocating it, she likes the power of the voice. But there are many other Australians uh, of Indigenous background, non-Indigenous background, uh, who think that, uh, as we do as a party, the constitutional recognition uh, is the right thing to do. The practical things that you can do for communities uh, involve money being spent on the ground, not in bureaucracy. I think the Prime Minister's splitting the country in two, uh, and I think it's a shameful act, to be honest. Dana Morse is an ABC political reporter and joins us now from Canberra. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Dan. Firstly, Dana, what did you make of Professor Marcia Langton's speech at the National Press Club yesterday? Well, it was what we've come to expect from Marcia Langton, who has been on the forefront of this campaign for such a long time, going back to when she co-authored that report with Tom Calmer as well. In parts, it was uh, insightful. In parts, it was cutting. And it was emotional as well for the Indigenous leader as she's heading into uh, the last push of this campaign to see whether all of this work is going to pay off or not. Mm. And we heard, Dana, there, the opposition leader today labelling Professor Langton a strong supporter of Labor and again said that the Prime Minister was splitting the country. Tell me, what are you seeing as the politics around the voice at Parliament House there? Well, it's been a, quite an interesting week at Parliament. Uh, obviously, Anthony Albanese started the week here and has left. Uh, the opposition took the time while he was here to have a crack at the government about The Voice, but they just don't seem to be particularly willing at this stage to engage with the actual proposal and the contradictions in their own argument. Um, Peter Dutton saying that the Prime Minister is splitting the country down the middle, doesn't engage with the fact that that's exactly what he's in, promised to deliver. Um, yet again, if he, if he wins, he sees a referendum as splitting the country down the, at, down the middle at the moment, but he's promised to hold a referendum of his own if he wins government by 2025. So it's, it's very uh, contradictory in Parliament House over the voice at the moment. Mm. Uh, and I think that it's, it's an interesting sort of juxtaposition of their two arguments. Yeah, and I, I guess that, that, that difference will be key. Peter Dutton would say that, that his referendum that he's proposed doesn't include the voice just about uh, recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution. Tell me about the Indigenous delegation that's been at Parliament. What have they had to say and what's happened? Well, there was a collective of people here from different peak organisations for health, mental health and Indigenous uh, mental health here. And they were calling basically for a respectful referendum. One of the people that was here was Dr Clinton Schultz. He's a uh, Gamilaroi Gomoroi man and also a psychologist. And what he was saying is that there is uh, an increased presentation of mob going and, and asking for mental health help and saying that they are experiencing psychological distress as a result of the referendum. So basically what this group was here to do was to advocate for a respectful referendum no matter what side of the debate that you are on. While they were here, they were told me that they were able to get meetings with the government, uh, with the crossbench, the Teals uh, and the Greens, but they weren't able to get any meetings with uh, members of the coalition. They had made um, a specific 
specific request to the Senator Jacinta Nambagimpa-Price, who's one of the leaders of the No campaign, and uh, she refused that meeting. I heard from her representatives this morning and they said it was just too difficult to turn around to get a meeting booked in uh, on that day that they were here. Mm, I want to bring in the rest of the panel. Sally, you're part of the Uluru Dialogues. Is the Yes campaign cutting through? I, I do believe that. I mean, I do have to address the um, the opposition leader and what Tony Albert said about Marcia and, and um, Noel is these are two incredible First Nations leadership who for decades have been fighting for change in our communities. And, you know, I've been in that room with them and there is such incredible leadership has got us to this space along with so many others. And I've been fortunate to be in that space. What I know is, you know, I've been at the Sydney Contemporary today and the amount of people that are coming up and saying, yes, we're for supportive of it. We've got our banners out. We're having conversations with our friends and, and our colleagues and our family members and the younger generation in their households, but also the older generation. They understand that this is a voice for all of us. This is about us getting to have that seat at the table. You know, when the opposition leader says he will do a referendum next year or the year after, that's him trying to win the next election, let's be honest. And also what he's saying there is that he hasn't listened to Aboriginal leadership. He hasn't listened to us now and he hasn't listened to us previously. You know, we tried to go down, they've tried to go down the recognised movement, but Aboriginal leadership did not want that. We don't want a sem symbolic recognition. We want real change. We want positive change for our communities. You know, we want to ha be at those those tables to say this is the issues and we have the solutions, so please listen to us. Hmm. Fiona, I understand that you don't support The Voice. What is your position? Um, I do support The Voice. I don't necessarily believe it belongs in the Constitution because I don't believe the Constitution should be... Um, race, religion, creed, sexuality, it should be... It but to should... be fair, it, it is. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we did that in 67. Yeah, so, so I, I think the... I think recognition is really important. Um, I think in many ways uh, what's happened here... I actually agree with everything Marsha the Langton said. I actually agree with her comment. I don't agree with what Tony Abbott said and I don't agree with his attack on people like Noel Pearce and I think he's actually wrong. I think the problem here is that it wasn't phased through properly and I don't think the way the politics has been managed by Anthony Albanese has actually provided the ability for this to be um, taken the Australian people on a journey with them. If it was step one that we had recognition step and then legislated the voice, Step two, yes, let's look at it into the Constitution. We've tried to, when we've tried to go through step one and step two or step three, we've always stopped at step one. Not necessarily, because even with this one... Because we've never gone to the next day. Because right. even with this, with this one, the next step, Albanese said, is that we go to the Republic. Now, if this doesn't get through, it's not just the division this has. And this is where Marcia Langton was so right. This is dividing the country. And if this does not get through, what this is going to harm on reconciliation is, is terrible. It is absolutely terrible and, and, and I think that is a bad thing. I just don't believe Anthony Albanese has managed the politics of this world. So that goes and I think he's sitting in that politics quickly. space. This is about changing our community's lives and this is where we don't, for us, this is the, the end game. This is what we need. We need to be able to make our communities better and safer and at an equal footing. I mean, it is... What, if this ends up being no, we are A, going to be the laughing stock of the world because we don't have anything in our constitution that acknowledges and respects our First Nations communities. There is nothing that's going to be in there that the next steps are going to fall down because you can't have a footy or um, an NRL round celebrating Indigenous round when you're not including us in the constitution. This is a document and made this, by... And this is why the process has been wrong. Yeah. And, and, and this is why, if we had gone straight for recognition to start with, 98% of the population... Would... But recognition, it, it sits in that space of recognition and it doesn't have meaningful change. It's not just about recognition, it's actually about representation. It's about representation. This oh, recognition. Respect, there, there is representation in the parliament now already. So no, it, it's... not the minute. It's not with. So it, those representatives that we have, the politicians that are there, that are First Nations, at the next election they might be voted out. 
and they're also there representing their communities and their their constituents. They're not there representing First Nations people. They're there representing their constituents. Yeah. Fiona, can I just ask, given that you were saying that you do support a voice but just a different process, given that this is the process that we have on the table, this is what's there right now, do you think that no, a no vote is better than a yes? I feel really conflicted by it. I feel really conflicted because I think the Constitution is flawed in the space that the Constitution is a document that went through the British Parliament that joined together the, col the British colonies, which denied that Aboriginal people were here in Australia, which means that it never included Aboriginal people in the first place. So I think there is a fundamental flaw in that piece and why I think recognition is really, really important. Um, I spoke at length about this in my maiden speech that I, I, I feel very passionately about that. And I really want to vote yes because of that. I also believe in the voice, but I'm not sure the voice belongs in the Constitution. I agree with everything you say about representation and finding other ways to deal with our communities and Aboriginal people with, with challenges. I'm just not sure that piece belongs in the Constitution. And I think if, the, um, if recognition was changed and that was put in and we legislated a voice and then step two was then potentially to put it in the constitution, then I'd be more comfortable in that process. And, and, and I think that's the problem where in that soft no area, that, it, it, that becomes the tripping point. We've had examples of a First Nations voice or advisory group or a committee or the different sort of languages people want to use in it, where w that have been there to advise the government and they've been demolished at every turn. And in 2017, out at Uluru, the Aboriginal leadership I got to be in it with and those incredible people who are community people, who weren't the ones that you see, like me, now on TV, they're not writing the opinion pieces. These were community people who said we're absolutely voiceless in our own communities. We're voiceless in this space. And they said we need something that is not going to be taken away but you at look, a change of government. But you look in my community, for instance, um, my community in Western Sydney was one of the communities most impacted by early colonisation in outskirts of Western Sydney because of the way the lands were stripped back at the time. But with the way New South Wales native title works, the Darug people don't exist in New South Wales native title, which means that the, the, the voice will either go to Durubbin or you'll go to Eora because Darug are getting wiped out. Mm. So, so there's a whole range yeah. of things that in some Aboriginal communities, mm. you know, Things like that native title piece in New South Wales should be rectified think, because those communities are going think, to be... That's another thing. I, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> well, but, but I no, think that it, raises it, the, it is the complexity. Another thing. Of, it is another yeah. thing, but who gets the voice and how does that actually go through? Because from somebody from Darug country, I want to see the Darug elders and the descendants of people like Yarra Mundi and Colby mm. to have a voice mm. as well. I, I think that also exposes some challenges around that piece of legislation and, and its iterations um, But nationally. if Albanese had have waited, he could have fixed or, some of these pieces. Or, or maybe they need to be worked on in independently. Peter, I want to bring you in, because a lot of discussion around the opposition leader putting a second referendum on the table just for recognition, as we've heard. So if next month's referendum fails, <coughs> what happens next? What does that mean in terms of the, what we know from the politicians so far? Well, it's 24 years since the uh, Republic uh, referendum fails, so maybe we won't see anything. I do, by the way, I, I, I shouldn't be flippant about it, but uh, the worst thing ever to happen for the No campaign since Albanese stood, stood next to Alan Joyce on a Qantas plane, outside a Qantas plane for the campaign. Yes campaign for Yes campaign, Yeah, yeah, the worst thing to happen... But the worst thing to happen to, to a leader happened uh, to Dutton when he said, in a land of compulsory voting, if you vote no, I'll give you another referendum. I don't exactly think that was, uh, that was a winner. But uh, more seriously, uh, can I just address the point that Tony Abbott made, you know, aside from his uh, unfortunate remarks, uh, perhaps, about two great Australians. The, the, the point he made was that... Um, uh, representation won't fix this, money will fix this. And I think we've now reached the point where we know that's not right. Australia has spent so much money on Aboriginal affairs, right? Um, for a long time. 
because Australians want to, and that hasn't improved things as much as you would think. And uh, all of the research shows that if you give people a feeling that they are, uh, th that, it, it, that it's their decisions, that they're not being imposed on them, it's not, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, housing and so on we had built it with a lot of money wasted in the intervention and so on, dictated from outside, that, that is what helps. Now, me, an economist, saying that money isn't everything, well, it's not. Um, a, a, a sense of empowerment is important as well and maybe, I don't know if it'll work, but it'd be good if it did, maybe The Voice will help in that. Harry, you posted on social media recently about The Voice. Tell me what happened. Yeah, I posted on social media saying that I was voting yes and my reasons as to why I was voting yes. and. I don't particularly like to read too many comments on my posts and I got, I think, 1,500 comments. Um, the, the comment box was just everyone debating about yes, no, why they're voting. Um, and it's just, it's such a politically charged conversation. And I almost, um, it almost like highlights the system we have now. And I do get the system is amazing. We live in a great country, but it's like, it's like if the left is saying, saying one thing, the right has to almost say the opposite. And it, I feel like it would just be so much more amazing. It's like if the left come up with a really good idea of like, OK, this is how we're going to attack or address this issue. And the right were like, actually, I can see some really valuable things in that. And I feel like that never happens in politics. And it's so frustrating. I think this is just highlighted now. Uh, Dana, I just want to bring you in to round us out be before we wrap up this section. You and I have been doing a lot of reporting, working in tandem on this uh, across lots of the ABC coverage. I just wonder... What are your observations about where, where we're at in the campaign over this next four or five weeks? I think we're in an incredibly interesting point in the campaign, Stan. Um, the phrase ramping up has been used more than a few times over the last 15 months. It must be an incredibly uh, a narrow incline on that ramp, but they'll continue to ramp up over the next five to six weeks as we head towards October 14. We know what the Yes campaign are doing. They're activating community volunteers. Last count I heard, they had around 30,000 community volunteers around the country uh, and collecting more every day. They're hitting the train stations and the tram stops and doing that one-to-one, -one, person to person campaigning, which I think people are crying out for in this because what I've heard from your panel tonight, this is an incredibly contested issue and people aren't across the facts. Um, and, and the politicians aren't really delivering them. They're delivering their party lines, but they're not delivering um, the simple answers that people want to know. And that's going to fall to the campaigners, I think, out there on the streets. We know what yes are doing. Uh, no, not so much. We don't really know what they plan to do in terms of um, community-based or person-to-person -person campaigning or whether there will be rallies, whether there'll even be a launch. Um, I know that a lot of uh, the no campaign materials have been going online. Um, there's certainly a lot of things going on around X, Twitter, TikTok, that sort of thing. Um, so it's interesting where they're directing their resources, certainly, because uh, they're, you know, all those polling mm. figures have shown that previously um, young people were swinging towards a yes vote. Maybe that's why no are focusing so hard online. But it's certainly going to be an interesting five or so weeks as we head towards October 14. Um, and I think it's important um, to, to echo the calls of the people that we hear uh, that this needs to be a respectful debate. It's not been modelled well by the politicians so far, certainly. Uh, but in terms of people talking with their family, their friends, keeping mob in mind and keeping how this is affecting, I mean, the word psychological distress, that's a problem. So we need to be having respectful debates around this and respecting differences, differences of opinion. Yeah, a very powerful point. Dana Morse is an ABC political reporter. Thanks for your company tonight. Thank you. Outgoing Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe has used his final public speech to set the record straight on what some view as a fraught term as his, his time as boss of the RBA. At the heart of the pandemic, he famously forecast that interest rates would likely stay at record lows until 2024, only to be followed by one of the steepest hiking cycles in the bank's history. In what was essentially a farewell speech, Governor Lowe declared that he never actually promised to keep rates low. 
The drums' David Taylor was there. Presiding over a big spike in interest rates in an economy with enormous levels of personal debt, Phil Lowe has copped plenty of heat during his time as RBA governor. Too much, he says. In my view is it will get better outcomes if the public square is filled with facts and with nuanced and informed debate rather than vitriol, personal attacks and clickbait. Philip Lowe was appointed as RBA Governor in 2016 by former Prime Minister Scott Morrison. His first two years on the job were relatively quiet. Then came five years of drama. None of us has a crystal ball and the unexpected happens and we need to adjust. His top priority as RBA Governor has always been to bring the inflation rate to between 2 and 3%. Prior to the pandemic, it was too low. During COVID, Australia actually experienced deflation, with big falls in prices at the shops. In early 2021, facing what he described as an economic abyss, Lowe said the cash rate was very likely to remain at its current record low level until at least 2024, to encourage a big ramp up in borrowing and spending. With the benefit of hindsight, my view is that we did do too much. But hindsight's a wonderful thing. Coming out of the pandemic, inflation's been running too hot. It's led to one of the steepest interest rate hiking cycles Australia has seen. Raising interest rates and tightening policy can make you very unpopular, as I know personally all too well. This means that it's easier for an independent central bank to do this than it is for the politicians to do it. I think this assignment of responsibility makes sense and it's worked reasonably well. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't aspire to something better. So what would better look like for Phil Lowe? Well, lower cost housing would be a start. That means zoning and land regulation reform. It means better transport systems in the cities and a more efficient tax system. That, he says, would ease the housing crisis. But he'd also like to set the record straight on a few loose threads. Including a promise that interest rates would not go up until 2024. Everybody needs to get a flatmate. Everybody needs to work more hours to make ends meet. And young adults should stay at home because of the rental crisis. But I did not make any of those points. And I might also add that I did not choose Justin Timberlake's Can't Stop the Feeling to accompany me as I walk to a, a speaking podium. His deputy, Michelle Bullock, will take over the reins later this month. You can't stop the feeling indeed. Peter, what did you take as the tone of Philip Lowe's well, farewell speech today? It was a very friendly gathering. Uh, the Annika Foundation, which he sits on the board, set up after the uh, suicide of uh, a daughter of uh, an OECD and former Reserve Bank official, Adrian Blundell Wignall. And it, uh, it actually... Uh, even though it was set up about her suicide to fight youth suicide, it uh, directs most of its resources uh, towards Indigenous suicide, which are much more uh, prevalent. So these, these are people, that, the people in the hall who have known him, who has known the work he does for that, and all of the questions were nice. It was a bit like a sort of, um, I suppose, memorial service for someone who's uh, still alive. Uh, people began their questions by paying tribute uh, to the governor. I think there are a number of criticisms you can make of the governor's term in office, uh, but uh, they weren't made. It mm. was, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, a gentle ending before he... Um, he's only 62, he's about to turn 62 next month, so uh, before he goes on to whatever's next. Yeah, and, and in fact... Fiona, it was almost like the, the outgoing governor was trying to just get his final word about a number of things, including uh, that comment about rate rises or interest rates not rising until 2024. He said that the comments were interpreted as a commitment rather than as a conditional statement. What does that mean? I don't know. If you can't work it out in your own journal, how am I supposed to work it out? Well, I was grappling with that. I <laughs> must have read that line a hundred times today. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think there's a lot to be said about Philip Lowe and um, it almost echoes our conversation before. I mean, Philip Lowe, it seems it's all been about politics. I mean, 
you know, in many ways, Albanese has, you know, the Albanese government haven't extended his tenure, which is the first time they've not done that to a governor, um, because he's pushed up interest rates. Now, that has been the formulaic version of interest rates for, you know, time immemorial. It's been what all the other, you know, feds and reserve banks around the world have had to do because of the way the economics was predicted through COVID. Um, personally, and I'm happy to be corrected on the economics here of it, but um, in, in many ways, I mean, I don't think the way the blunt object, the rubber mallet of interest rates has been the right mechanism when you've got inflation coming at us. It, it wasn't because spending was out of control. In many ways, it was because supply chains had been built up. We'd had you know, two years of lockdowns. We had all of these other abnormalities going on in the economy. And frankly, you know, Liberal and Labor governments got the spending wrong through COVID. You know, we all thought it was right at the time and maybe there needed to be more, but retrospectively, you look back and fiscal policy was wrong. So, so, so what, what do you do here? I mean, you then use the rubber mallet of monetary policy and then when that goes up, what do you do? You sack the, the governor. And so, so I think in many ways, it's like a political band-aid here. The Labor has fixed the problem there, but are they going to then counteract and take that same medicine when it comes to the budget next year? Probably not. And, and, and I think that's where I have to say I do feel empathy for, for Philip Lowe. But at the same token, sure, he, he, he got a few things wrong, but you know, I'm not giving him a get out of jail free card, but Fiona, a lot of people I, did as well. I, I, I won't disagree with you about the economics, but I will disagree with you about why Lowe has lost his job. He lost his job not because he put up interest rates. Uh, indeed, the, the, the previous treasurer, uh, Josh Frydenberg, initiated the or announced an inquiry that he'd hold one into the Reserve Bank. Uh, the uh, current treasurer drew up the terms of reference. That inquiry found very bad administrative practices in the Reserve Bank and recommended that they be changed. That's what I was saying when I were, were referring to when I said... I'm not denying are, any of that there, either. There, but, but that's why you could not have that inquiry, which basically found, and to quote from the inquiry, groupthink, that people in the Reserve Bank were unwilling to, to question decisions of higher-ups. Um, you could not have an inquiry finding those things uh, and then introduce a new structure for the Reserve Bank and then have the person who had presided over the previous structure not only for six or seven years as governor, but for the six or seven years before that as deputy governor, um, implementing it. He had to go. It's not because of... Uh, you, you don't need to, to look at decisions he made about interest rates. You need to look about what the inquiry into the administration of the Reserve Bank found. So I don't think that Jim, Far Jim uh, Chalmers has uh, not extended his term because he pushed up interest rates. So there, there's enough other reasons. I, much I, as I, I like, much as I, pr I, I think Lowe's a very good person, but um, th they found bad things about the administration of the Reserve Bank. And in those circumstances, mm. he couldn't have been... Uh, renewed. But but even going hi historically before that, when you look at things like the Banking Royal Commissions and other things, there you could have always looked at these things at different points in the past. It seems I don't disagree with anything you said. I agree with you. But at the same token, the politics and the way the Labor Party have played this has been mm. about some of these other things. It's it's almost, I mean, even going back to the beginning of the show with Catherine King, it's a framing thing. It's about the terms of reference. It's about all these different factors. But it was also very convenient for the Labor Party to do that, to have the optics of how it looks that the guy that puts your interest rates up to the, the mum and dad with mortgage stress sitting out in the outer suburbs of our capital cities, you know, oh, we, we've got that guy now. And and you're right, and I agree with you in, the, in what you're saying about that, but I'm not 100% convinced that was the actual motivating factor for the Labor Party to politically act on those things as well. I think there is also the optics as to what they wanted to see that they've done. Betty, do you want to respond briefly to that? <laughs> no. No, OK. <laughs> Uh, well, look, who's to say about optics? I, I don't know. But, um, but uh, he could not have been renewed given the findings of the Reserve Bank review. Whether that's convenient or not, I don't know. But if Josh Frydenberg had been in the Treasurer's chair, he was going to commission that review. It would have found the same 
very bad things about mm. the administration of the Reserve Bank and the Governor's term would have been up as well. All right, well, we will have to move on finally tonight. Does the acronym UFC mean anything to you? It is, in fact, the fastest growing sports competition in the world. And this weekend, Australia is the centre of the UFC universe. The ultimate fighting championship is the Vegas-based Premier League of mixed martial arts full contact combat that thrills fans with spectacular athleticism, and try and say that twice, and riles critics who say it celebrates violence and sexist attitudes. This Sunday, the UFC returns to Sydney after a $16 million investment from the New South Wales government. Ben Johnston, a fighter and coach from Logan in Queensland, hopes it attracts even more local competitors. He spoke to the drum. They went in for a look. We were just checking out. They said, oh, there's a classroom. Do you want to jump in? I like had all my work kit on. I was like, yeah, let's go. At that age where I was like just before I turned 18, um, it's just, it felt like it was an important skill. There's just something about the, the, the event, the scale they do it on, how they run the promotion. It's just so much more exciting and the stakes are so high. Like, you might get caught with a punch, you might get caught with a kick, you might get caught with a submission. And then right before the main card starts, they, they have this, like, a montage where they've got the Who playing and... There's just highlights from over the years. It's just, a, man, it gives you goosebumps. You watch it and you just cannot help but get excited. I just want to have a crack at it. I just want to see where I'm at, see where the best in the world are, see what they're doing and chase after that and see, see how I stack up. And I think, like, I have this, like, idea that I think I'm good enough to do this. I want to go and see. So we have a 1,000 members. You get, you get all sorts, you know, like, you get everybody down here. Most commonly, it's going to be a young male, like between 17 and 21. That's like 1% of the community, you know? And if you can build that 1% and change that 1% to give you, like, try, make them try and be better and try and strive for better things, that kind of has a ripple effect. And that's, you might actually move the needle. In a place like Logan, you know, like, you know, we're probably known for all the wrong things. We're not necessarily like trying to make Logan better by going out and shaking hands and kissing babies or whatever. And you're in the same room and it's like, there's a world champion there. There's a world champion there. And there's a world champion kickboxer and there's a world champion karate guy. And like, you just realize, like, I could touch and feel this. I can see that. And here you get, they call it the rub. You know, it's like, this is doable, this is achievable. I can do this. Well, Nick Campton is an ABC sports reporter and joins us at the desk. Nick, that is not for the faint-hearted. Now, ABC viewers will most likely know, have a sense of what boxing is. What's the difference for this? I guess the biggest difference would be boxing is a single discipline in a, in a combat sport and mixed martial arts, it's right there in the name, it mixes together all the different martial arts that somebody can undertake. So there's elements of boxing, there's elements of wrestling, elements of jiu-jitsu, elements of, of kickboxing, basically any sort of martial art from anywhere over the world, it all gets mixed together and then mixed martial arts comes out on the other side and then the UFC is the single biggest promotion in the, in the world of mixed martial arts. Is saying it, it's a bit of everything another way of saying that there are no rules? <laughs> no, no, that's a common, that's a common misconception. <laughs> it's a common misconception. When, when the UFC was first sort of formulated in the early 90s, it was uh, marketed as having no rules and, and being no holds barred, but that's, that's never been the case. There were rules back then and there's only been more and more rules added over the, over the last 30 years. This is not a, a spectacle, this is not a blood sport, this is a, a genuine sport, mm. a genuine athletic contest. And, and it's grown uh, by millions watching these events around the world. Why do you think that is? I think that it's... I, I think the appeal of, of combat sports is something that goes a very long way back into, into human history. If you just look at the at the, at the success that boxing's had ever since it sort of became solidified as a, as, a, as a proper sport in the late 19th century, there's always been that appetite for, for combat sports. And I think the, the UFC just sort of satiates a different part of that appetite to, to boxing. And I think the success that it's had and the rise that it's had over the last... 30 years is a is a good indicator that there is a demand for for this kind of sport and if there's that demand it will always be supplied and it's not been without 
criticism, has it been the violence is one thing, then there's a particular competitor who regularly courts controversy with uh, his views. There's been more blowback today on the government, in fact, hasn't there? Yeah, there has. So there's a UFC event in uh, Sydney on Sunday and one of the headlining fighters is an American named Sean Strickland. He's fighting a New Zealander named Israel Adesanya for the title and Sean Strickland's, I guess, kind of his whole deal, his whole gimmick is to say controversial, inflammatory things to draw attention to himself. You know, that's a, a very old trick in the book of combat sports and it's one that never really seems to get old. And Strickland has been saying all sorts of, uh, to me, reprehensible things this week in an effort to sort of drum up interest for the fight. It's uh, probably not a tasteful way to promote a fight, but it's the way that it's the way that they go more often than not some some of these fighters yeah it seems some of that gets cut through harry you've talked about that undeniable animal instinct that you feel inside the boxing ring now ufc takes this i it seems to me to the next level can you understand that appeal particularly to young men Absolutely. I um, I always uh, I think about us as animals. That's what we are, right? <laughs> I wrote a poem before my last fight, and the last three lines were, grateful to constantly be reminded all that we are is barbaric animals trying to act civilised. And I, I truly, truly believe that. Like, we have this animal instinct inside of us. We all feel fight or flight, nerves, anxiousness, feelings and emotions we sometimes can't control. And I think... There is many, and I've felt this myself, but there is many, particularly young men, but young people who feel aggression, who feel these things. And I think combat sport gives them something where they can learn to control those emotions, learn, learn to control those feelings and put them to good use. You look at the, um, is it in Queensland, the youth crime rate that's going on up there, the crisis up there. It's like if there was a, I know there is many boxing gyms or combat sport gyms, but if there was just more direction or... Um, not just combat sport, but sport in general, I think really creates better outcomes for young people. But I've felt it myself that we are just animals and I'm so grateful that all that combat sport has allowed me to feel because I have learned, I guess, to control my emotions a lot more than when I was younger. I love that you write poetry before you jump into the ring <laughs> for, a, for about just saying. Do you think something like mixed martial arts is a constructive outlet for aggression? A even though some call it an uncivilised violence? Yeah, it's, it's definitely... I, I personally, at times, don't particularly like watching the UFC because at times it does get a little bit... Um, it kind of looks a little bit messy. You mean, when there is one specific discipline, like I'm a boxer, I've been a boxer for almost 20 years, there's a beauty, we know what's happening. When you put all of them together, it kind of looks a little bit confusing, right? But I do respect and I do understand the beauty and I understand that... There is many people in the UFC and many of the most successful have come, come from super humble beginnings and it has changed their life for the better and it's changed the world for the better. If they didn't find combat sport, if they didn't find the UFC, they would have been doing a completely different thing and I think many of the champions, many of the people who fill up the gyms potentially could have went down a completely different path, way more negative and I think combat sport, I have seen in my own life has saved so many young people. So I'm, I'm an absolute advocate for it. Uh, Peter, I understand that you were a world championship wrestling fan as a, as a, <laughs> I used as to be a, as a, as a kid. What do you make of this now? We need to distinguish between two things. Violence is good. Concussion is really, really bad. And it's in the apparently unviolent sports, AFL, where it's now, you know, 30 years after the event coming out. So, um... I agree with you, Harry, right? I agree with you. It's part of the human thing. It's better than going to war, right? Mm -hmm. It's better than doing a whole lot of other things. Um, and violence, particularly where you know that no one's going to get seriously hurt, is good. But we cannot have people concussed, including in boxing. Mm. Mm. Sally, I, I want to bring you in. You had a son, Walter, who's eight, has got a truckload of personality. <laughs> is he interested in this form of sport? Um, I haven't shown him UFC or yet, yet um, I'm, and I'm sure the older cousins will. Um, at the moment, he's really obsessed with swimming. If it was up to him, we would live in the water. Um, but I think that, that what Harry was saying about having an outlet, I mean, the story with Logan City, obviously there are these pockets of communities that need those outlets, they need those um, support and for young men and also I think young women. I think that there's, there's a missing sort of 
um, element to that. We, we look too much of them, men, 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 boys. There is women and mm, girls that do that too. And I think that would be incredible to have those sort of different elements of um, outlets, you know, in particularly the outer metro, you know, outer suburban, you know, in our regional remote communities to have those sorts of places for in a safe environment for our young people to mm. experience and learn how to use their emotions, whether it is UFC or if it's boxing like Harry does or karate or whatever. Yeah. I mean, we do are uh, looking towards, um, uh, what is it, an Olympics in Brisbane. So what does that look like, you know? How are we going to make sure that we have, you mm. know, some incredible Australian superstars in in all the fields rather than just um, athletics and the swimming? <laughs> oh, we might have someone on the panel who's going to be competing in uh, 32. Fiona, though, I want to bring you to, uh, to to you. What do you make of all this? Um, game on. Like, <laughs> let's get ready to rumble. I mean, like, sorry, but, but look, if, 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 if that's your jam... Well, you were a politician. <laughs> yeah, not, not in the chamber now. Yeah, one of my many, many sins. But, um, <laughs> but look, I, I think, look, if that's your jam, that's your jam. I, I agree with what you're saying with the, the concussion issues, mm. but... I don't know how you do a combat sport or like with this, how do you knock someone out if you're not punching them in the head? Like, I'm sorry, but it, it does take a lot of skill. And, and you look at, you know, the fighter on the weekend saying he's sexist stuff. I mean, if that came out of the mouth of Dana White, then I'd have issues. Mm. But you look at Wanda, Ronda Rousey, she's what, one of the highest paid sportswomen, second highest paid in the UFC. Um, so women do get a fair crack in in UFC and, and, and I think it's one of those sports that um, it's not just a bloodbath of people getting in there and punching on there is a lot of skill in there and there's a lot of heritage in each of those different mixed mm. martial arts mm. going into the history of Thailand or Vietnam or all of those things karate kung fu all of these different things I was going to say yoga which is really <laughs> wrong but 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 it, there's so many of these different sports there and and I 100% concur with what you were saying as well about, you know, the young people that this got off the street and, and people who may have had really disadvantaged upbringings, but they've found young men have finding an outlet to curb their aggression and finding positive role models and, and mm. all of those things. So it's not my thing. I don't think I'll ever watch it, but, you know, it's... <laughs> I, I, don't, I can't even get into boxing. I don't like watching that sort of stuff, but... You know, I like falling off horses, so if people go. want to hurt themselves other ways, <laughs> knock yourself out, Nick, literally. Nick, Nick, you've got about 30 seconds uh, left. What should we keep an eye out for this weekend? I think the thing to look out for would be some of the local guys on the card. Uh, there's some fighters from Western Sydney, Taito Avasa and Tyson Pedro, who, like we've talked about, are, are really good examples for their for their community out there and, and, a, and, a, and a great example of, uh, of something for those communities to aspire to. And there's another fighter... Justin Taffer from Logan in Queensland, and he's got a similar kind of story. And uh, I think it plays in nicely into what Harry was talking about earlier. Yep. So they're, they're the ones to watch. There you go. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and you're getting nods from Harry uh, as you're mentioning those names. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. Thanks to our guest, Nick Campton. Great to have you along. Thanks to our panel, Sally Scales, Fiona Scott, <laughs> Peter Martin and Harry Garza. I do have an excellent evening. Julia Baird is back with you tomorrow for now. Good night.